Thanks, comrades. One of the disadvantages of taking the aeroplane as often as I have recently is you get the chance to read the Australian. I, I read the Australian from cover to cover when I went to Cairns a month ago, um, and I had, had the joy um, of reading it again a couple of days ago. And when you read that paper, it really put in perspective the fact that it's not just a class war budget that Tony Abbott's unveiled, but his government rep represents the stepping up of the ruling class war and our rights, standard of living and environment more generally. Because in, in addition to all the stuff about the budget, there was all the expected stuff about union busting and the big campaign they're drumming up now to get rid of penalty rates and fair income. I tell you, as someone who's done my share of shift work, to suggest that you don't deserve penalty rates for working weekends, working night shift, the cost that it has on your, your, your family life, your, your personal life, your, your, your physical and mental health. I mean, people who do shift work a lifetime are estimated to live about 10 years less, you know, but these miserable bastards have got that in their sight now. Um, you know, it just makes my blood boil, along with everything else that's, that, that's going on. And of course, amongst the people clamouring for, for, um, to get rid of penalty rates is all, all the big retail capitalists, including uh, West Farmers, Western Australia's great uh, gift, gift, to, gift to the nation, uh, Western Australia's big conglomerate, which um, in addition to owning um, Bunnings and Coles and um, insurance outfits and all, heaps of other things, um, also owns a... Um, a coal mining operation called Griffin Coal over in Western Australia, and that's something I'll come to a moment. In, in, a, in a moment. About two years ago, I actually attended the West Farmers a AGM, not, not one of my normal haunts, but um, I, was, I was there wearing an activist hat. I had a proxy from, from the activists in the Australian West Sahara Association who'd lined me up to get up and <laughs> ask a question about their Im import of phosphate from uh, Western Sahara. Anyway, um, I was there sort of waiting my turn um, it, uh, to, to ask that question. And Richard Goiter, who's the CEO of West Farmers, remember this was two years ago that I went to this meeting, boasted, gleefully boasted, about the, the campaign they ran to defeat the mining tax. <coughs> that mild-mannered mining tax that was, only, was going to be redistributed to the other capitalists who aren't involved in mining wasn't even going to be spent on us. You know, and you just remember how you know what a you know sustained you know uh, and vitriolic campaign that these that these people ran. I mean, that's 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 ruling class power talking. You know, that's 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 a, it's just so apparent to me there. But West Farmers is a funny company because um, it started its life as like a farmers cooperative. So the majority of the of the the real human beings in the room were just kind of like mum and dad farmers from the WA wheat belt. Of course, the majority, they weren't the majority of the votes in the room, they were all institutional shareholders down the front row, but the majority of real human beings were mum and dad West Australian farmers. And one of them quite you know, genuinely and innocently sort of put up, their, put up their hand and asked a question and asked whether West Farmers was going to transition out of coal eventually and get into renewable energy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, she asked this question, you know, totally, you know, you know she was sincerely, you know. Um, and um, this guy, Richard Goiter, looked at it and just said, we are confident that coal will be a central part of the energy mix in Western Australia for the next 30 to 50 years. Next topic, you know? Um, and he could be confident of that, because at that very same time, the Western Australian government was spending $200 million in a failed attempt to restart a closed coal-fired power station called Mooja or Mooja B or something like that. And the irony for me, at that very moment, the Fremantle community, progressives in Fremantle, were locked in a battle with the state government and the Fremantle Port Authority to try and get up the Fremantle community wind farm, a wind farm that had got planning approval from Fremantle City Council, a wind farm where all the geotechnical, you know, wind, um, bird flight patterns, all that, all, all that survey work had been done, a, a wind farm that could have existed at one of the very, very few places in an urban environment where you could put a, put a wind farm, because it's a container port. It's already an in, in, in industrial landscape with things making a lot more noise than, than a wind farm's ever going to make. Um, and of course, the fantastic thing about that wind farm 
is it would be is, is it's, it's it's power of example you know that renewable energy can work but that's exactly the reason why um, these bastards have conspired to stop it from happening and in fact the the collective behind the Fremantle community wind farm um, had a meeting with the Port Authority about a year ago and the Port Authority said, oh, look, we've done our own surveys and um, we've concluded it's not viable, so we're not going to lease you the land. They, they don't need much. They just need you know, land for like 12 towers, you know, lease land from the Port Authority. Oh, we've done our own surveys you know, that show it's not viable. And this chap, Raoul, I know, who's a German engineer who's, who's very involved in it, said, oh, really? You've done your survey? We'd love to see that survey. Can we have a look at it? Oh, no, no, no you can't. That's confidential. Now, they did a freedom of information thing, finally got it, about 80 per cent of the thing is blacked out. You know? I mean, that's, you know, that's, what, you know, that's what we're up against. And I, I like to say that there is something that's much more frightening than climate change deniers. It's the people that know it's happening and don't give a shit. These people, they're intelligent people, people running Australia, people who run Western Australia in particular, you sure as hell feel it in Western Australia, these people are calm in the face of the fact that, they are, they, that we are on the cusp of precipitating a mass species extinction event of the sort that would no, normally only come about because an asteroid plun, plunged into the planet or the, you know, the Earth tilted on its axis a little bit or something like that. And, and, and they're just about to roll it out, calm. So it should come, should come as no surprise to us that they've, that, that they've, they've they've released the kind of budget that they just have, that their lackeys have rolled out the kind of budget that they just have, a budget that's designed to shift what little bit of the social wage we have left to spend it on big business. It's not about smaller government, it's about taking the money and shoveling it towards them. And, you know, climate change, for them, the Richard Goiters, these big capitalists and the governments that serve them, they can build desal plants and stuff like that. You know? They'll live in their little bubbles and filtered air, that sort of stuff. And if 15 million Bangladeshis, uh, sorry, 150 million Bangladeshis you know, lose their homes because of rising seawaters, people who never caused it, the, the problem in the first place, take to the sea, fuck them, stop the boats. We've got a solution. That's their solution. That quite literally is their worldview. That is their plan. And makes it apparent to us why a socialist transformation is just is, is an utter social and environmental necessity, both to re redistribute wealth so that we have a sustainable future and so that we have any kind of meaningful democracy. Of course, the big question is how to get there, and um, the answer to that one is complex, and it's the sort of thing we'll be discussing over the next few days. But we do know that you, that you need to start where you're at, where we are today. And that's where... I think we should be throwing everything we've got at this campaign to block the budget for a few reasons. One immediate thing that connects with Australian politics is I don't think we can take it for granted that this uh, refugee bashing weapon of mass distraction, which has been a key feature of Australian politics in the last two decades, um, has kind of automatically bottomed out. You know, and it couldn't get any worse. I mean, but what you can say is we've been given a critical opening, an opportunity to say to people, wake up, smell the coffee. Can't you see it? It's not refugees that are making your life miserable. They're threatening you with insecurity. It's the Abbott budget. Um, it, it, there's an opening, you know? Um, and, but to not to seize that opening, um, it, you know, it, it could get worse. That's, so so that, that, that's, you know, we, we, have, we have an opportunity to focus people's anger. And secondly, because the sentiment around this budget, the widespread rejection of it, the fact that some opinion polls suggest that the majority of Australians would like to see another election on this question, reminds us that we need to be searching out the beginning of our new people's movement for change, even if it's just the beginnings. Where is our Podemos going to come from? You know, I don't know what the other rallies were like, but the, the, the Perth march, march in May, I was really struck. I mean. It wasn't a mass, mass movement, but three, 4,000 people when they had no institutional, institutional backing, that's impressive. You know, that, it wasn't just the far left. There were lots of ordinary, angry folk there, you know, and that gave me a bit of, a, a bit of a sense of that. Is it yet gonna be enough pressure? Is it yet big enough to gen generate the pressure to, to, to force Greens and Labor to, to, to block that budget and force another election? Well, I, uh, probably not. 
um, and that's, that's, you know, but we've got to give it our best shot, you know, because we've got to take people through that process. Um, the people who, who agree with us, they're precious people. You know, I haven't been, you know, I won't say I've been around the movement long enough to, to, to say I'm an old timer of the movement, but one thing I think I can say with absolute confidence is that it's not hard to convince people that capitalism is fucked up, you know, but what it is hard to do is to convince people that you can do something about it. And we want to capture people who are in a positive frame of mind that, yes, there, there, there can be a different kind of future. There can be a certain different kind of direction for our society. We, we want to couple with those people, take them through that experience and use this as a building base for the future. Um, and we need to be open to the possibility that that, that, that new movement for change is, is going to come outside of the, the structures and forms and formats that, that, that we're used to. Uh, we need to seize, 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 seize this moment like, like our future depends on it. Dare to struggle, dare to win.